we arrive upon the rocky shores of the River Styx, where mortal souls are first introduced to their infernal fate, as we begin our journey beyond the fiery gates of perdition. Witness the harrowing and often disturbing methods by which these petitioners are harvested, tormented, and transformed, and explore the twisted economy that drives these nine hells and fuels the never-ending blood war. We've covered the backstory. Are you now prepared to venture forth? Welcome to hell. Right now on Riches and Liches. Welcome adventurers, I'm Rich and this is Riches and Liches, dedicated to dungeons, dragons, and tales of lore. Wow, volume five already. We've shared so much through the four volumes that are now behind us. We've laid all the groundwork, introduced you to our source, and detailed the necessary origin and backstories of myth and legend, all in preparation for this very moment, because today serves as an important demarcation in our journey. This, Volume 5, begins our descent into the Nine Hells, at least from a soul's perspective. As many of you likely already know, the lore through the various editions has its share of conflicts and retcons, many of which cannot be easily reconciled or coalesced, so scholarly or historic choices must be made. While these volumes from Greiley Tomekeeper purport to be the canonical truth, at the end of the day, what is canon at your table is what your table decides. So to help you with this assimilation and selection, as we recount this lore together, I will endeavor to call out those alternative theories, mythologies, and beliefs, and identify where the path of history is more murky, shrouded in the unknown, so that you may draw your own conclusion. We've covered a lot, but so much remains to be covered. Never forget, together we are a lore archaeology team, so please help our continued discoveries by grabbing your trowel, spade, or pick and smashing those like and subscribe buttons so I can keep producing these videos for years to come. It really helps with the RNG dice roll that is the YouTube algorithm. Thank you. And now I present as part of our continued journey together, Volume 5 in our iconic lore mega series on the Nine Hells, Welcome to Hell. For many, it starts with a choice. Fueled by blind ambition, greed, or lust, lured with tantalizing promises of power, wealth, or even forbidden love, those mortal souls with short-sighted views enter into a dark bargain, an unholy pact, an infernal contract, or a malevolent decree, and thus forever commit their soul to the infernal hells. For others, those that have not succumbed to the temptations of a Faustian pact, their path to this hellish afterlife is determined by their alignment, their allegiance to a particular deity, as well as their decisions and choices made in life. Some commit their souls to Beator by openly or secretly worshiping evil. Still others find their way here through their own evil actions, or perhaps through dealings and associations with dark entities and cults. Regardless their mortal life now over, the price of those choices made is steep, and now due, as an eternity of servitude and torment awaits. These nine hells of Beator are reserved for lawful evil souls and others regardless of alignment that find themselves in the service or debt of the Batazu. And upon the demise of their mortal flesh, well, well, that is where we, in our attempt to provide a definitive and complete telling of the lore, run into our first series of conflicts among the various editions of our source material. One theory from the second edition claims that most souls arrive in Beator take the form of larvae that are systematically tortured, while even in their writhing maggot-like forms, they are pitted against each other in a Darwinian style of last man standing survival of the fittest all in order to determine those extreme select few that might win the infernal lottery, literally one in approximately 8,000 according to the source, that might be promoted into an only slightly better form, that of a Lemur. While the maggot pit was not known of or documented until the third edition, it seems more than reasonable to me that it has always existed, perhaps just undiscovered. And so, if you're adopting first or second edition lore for your table, 
Placing all incoming larvae into this horrible pit of despair would not only be plausible, but quite logical and a natural evolution of the process. Keeping with the second edition, there are some additional variants to this initial soul processing lore that include exceptions to the initial larvae stage for some souls, some petitioners who were especially evil in their mortal life, allowing them to take the initial form of Lemures or even Neparibos, for example. It should also be noted that 4th edition is woefully lacking in any details on this process, and 5e is only slightly better, simply stating all petitioners arrive as Lemures. Boring. One can attribute both these tremendous gaps in one of two ways. That these later editions simply just didn't want to deal with the darker and sometimes not mass appealing subject matter. Or one can put on some rose colored glasses and choose to believe that Wizards of the Coast in their infinite wisdom, knowing the canon from the third edition is both amazing and well established, took the why fix what is not broken approach. That's likely wishful thinking on my part, but it matters not, because the scribe of the dam provides us his claim of fact through his writings, along with his declaration attributing those words to the Lord of the Nine himself. Regardless, this is my canon that I will submit to you now for your own review. Now, where were we before we meandered down one of the many rabbit holes of conflicting lore? This is, by the way, not the last time we will veer off course, but it's all in the name of thoroughness. Ah, yes, here we are. Upon the demise of the mortal flesh, their soul, along with all souls of any alignment, will be drawn to the fugue plane within the Astral Sea, arriving at the City of Judgment, where Kelimvor presides as the Judge of the Dead. For the purposes of these iconic lore volumes, we may also refer to these fresh souls by their proper title, Petitioners. It should be noted that the term Petitioner does not apply to only infernal souls. Point in fact, a petitioner can best be defined as any mortal soul that has, by one means or another, transmigrated from the material plane to any other plane of existence. And now, having done exactly that, arriving at Kelimvor's neutral domain on the fugue plane, a petitioner is an appropriate label for these souls. Now, despite his title, Kelimvor's role here is not primarily to judge the path for every petitioner. For the vast majority of souls, that determination is made based upon their mortal action, the deity they chose to worship most in life, and ultimately that deity's claim on the soul in the afterlife. However, on occasion a more ambiguous case does arrive. Perhaps a petitioner is contested between two gods. They were both worshipped at various times in the mortal's life, and both now are laying claim to the soul. It is in these scenarios where Kelimvor will make a judgment on the petitioner's destination in the afterlife. While here, the petitioner may wait up to 10 days as divine servants from across all alignments and domains arrive to claim, collect, and even bargain with the recently deceased. While you are undoubtedly aware of the Faustian pacts made in life, it may be surprising to learn that in fact many bargains and contracts are also negotiated here in the neutral fugue plane with these new incoming souls. Focusing back on our infernal targets, at this time the Batazu are allowed to bargain and negotiate with souls, being tempted, some might even say frightened or intimidated, by informing these waiting petitioners on their soon-to-be future, usually in the form of describing a, the terrible eternal torment and agony that awaits them. Using these tactics, the devils can thus bargain for the fate of the mortal soul as a new infernal petitioner, sometimes offering faster promotions or some benefit or even punishment on a still living mortal soul. All done with the end goal to ensure that a new soul is delivered to Avernus. Those souls that are destined for the Nine Hells find themselves materialized on the cold, blood-soaked, rocky shores of the River Styx. 
This infernal reception area, reserved for these souls of the damned, is known as the Shelves of Despond, located on Avernus, the blood-drenched and war-torn first layer of hell. A critical point to highlight here, least you get the all-too-common stereotypical image in your mind's eye of some wispy ethereal spirit slowly drifting across the plains of hell as some form of lost soul or ghost, not even close, my friend. In fact, think the exact opposite of that and you will be much closer to the truth, which is that these souls arrive as horrifying, deformed versions of their former mortal selves, still comprised of flesh, blood, and bone, but at the same time reflecting a haunting, rubbery, even wax-like sheen that make them an all the more unsettling sight to behold. And these animated, grotesque, and misshapen silhouettes come to these bloody shores still bearing any and all wounds, sicknesses, or other calamities they suffered during their last moments of mortal life. Those that maintained their ability to move about before death also still carry a limited version of that mobility with them in this, their new agonized form. These souls in this a pitiful state, these crude, shambling, stumbling, and crawling forms are known as soul shells. However, even those with some ability to move about are not left alone long enough to make much ground as an ever-awaiting company of Barbazoo, also known as Bearded Devils, patrol and navigate the dread waters of the River Styx. These devil soul collectors make their way to these rocky shores in order to collect and identify these soul shells for delivery to a plain specific intake station to ensure each soul is documented, cataloged, and counted for that is the way of the highly disciplined and ordered state of the Nine Hells. This identification process is performed by way of a distinct scent that each soul shell carries, clearly marking them as a possession of a particular lord. Some alternative beliefs claim that these soul shells carry more visible marks in order to make the same identification. Perhaps both are true. But I personally like the idea of using scent. It feels so very primal, unique, and devil-like. The barbed soul collectors, having gathered the ghastly soul shells, haul them ashore amid an unrelenting chorus of agonized cries and moans, piling them into caged carts for transport throughout the various layers of Beator, where their essence is to be extracted, destined for their lawful owners. Often using the river Styx as a means of transporting these souls, the Barbazoo take fierce care to ensure the souls do not come in contact with its bloody, fetid waters, as the Styx forever erases the memories of any soul that touches it, and each soul shell yields much more infernal energy if their identities are intact when their torment and extraction begins. Occasionally, you will also find an Omnizu devil nearby watching over the proceedings. These Styx Devils, as they're also known, are one of only four known fiendish types that are immune to the powerful and dread danger of the waters within this unholy river of blood and filth. The other three being the massive toad-like Hydroloths, the Charon-like boatmen and supreme navigators of the River Styx, known as Marenoloths, and the enormous and deadly eel-like Wastroliths. An intelligent but hateful and arrogant lot, the Omnizu take sadistic pleasure in watching the Barbazoo delicately navigate the waters, trying themselves to avoid its deadly effects. While it would be far more pragmatic for the Omnizu, with their immunity to the profane powers of the river, to handle this dangerous task of soul transportation, this is far below their hierarchical station, and an Omnizoo never tires of the delight they savor when a Barbazoo itself falls prey to the dark waters. Regardless of their presence and inaction during the arrival phase, the Omnizoo will in nearly all instances be present for and deeply involved in the documentation of soul shells upon their arrival to any of the numerous intake slash torture stations, the largest of which is the jangling hider in Mineros, known by many other names such as Torture City, the City of Chains, City of Rattling Madness, and the Place of Chain-Torn Flesh. 
<laughs> this not top 10 tourist spot is a subject we will take great pleasure in highlighting in a future volume. When a shipment of soul shells arrive at one of these stations, the ink-drenched bureaucratic Omnizoo record the name of the devil responsible for harvesting the soul in a massive diabolical ledger. This intake is typically supervised by Iranis devils who file regular reports to their lords listing the top soul harvesters. These reports become an essential part of the equation regarding any promotion prospects, especially for devils at work on the material plane. Once the intake is complete, the soul shells begin a program of extraction, but let's call it what it is, gruesome torture, the details of which are best left devoid of words and to the imagination. Think Hellraiser movies times 10 and you might be in the ballpark. Performed most often by chain rattling chitons, also known as chain devils, this sustained and systematic torture is intended to abolish any trace of the petitioner's memory and individuality while also extracting the very essence of the soul, the magical energy that drives these infernal hells. The energy released then flows to the local lord as specified in the very words written within the Pact Primeval, which we covered in exacting detail in Volume 3, a link to which you can find at the top of the screen about now. At the completion of this agonizing extraction, once the last spark of essence has been brutally wrung from the soul, what remains, the convulsing petitioner shell, is discarded into a processing crater, the most infamous of which is the maggot pit in Avernus. There it will be reborn as a lemure, a mindless, nearly formless, quivering mass of agony, retaining none of its previous mortal identity, and that resides at the very bottom of the Batazu hierarchy. While Lemures are incapable of conscious thought, they do retain a drive for advancement from this wretched state, instinctively knowing that opportunity does exist for those Lemures that can distinguish themselves from the countless others writhing next to them. While they have no ability to communicate, they do understand infernal orders given to them and will mindlessly obey, driven by that singular ambition of rising in the ranks. These now infernally owned souls can go by many names, most in reference to their high value as a primary currency in the diabolical economy of hell. Coin, clank, even treasure. Every fiendish devil seeks this soul currency, the power, the raw magic we just discussed that is extracted from each and every soul damned to these infernal layers. This constant need to harvest new souls, to feed the infernal legions, to drive the war machines of the blood war, to the innate and terrible powers of the archdukes themselves, all possible only with the harnessed raw soul energy of the damned. Again, as laid out in the Pact Primeval. And it is this immeasurable value that motivates nearly every action undertaken by devil kind, especially on the material plane, all toward the ultimate goal of soul collection. Though souls are Beator's primary currency, gold and other treasure items are still quite valuable and sought after as the next best trade goods. After all, these diabolical machinations, temptations, and conspiracies in the material plane require huge infusions of wealth. From provisions to cults and minions to spies and assassins, and even bribing of officials, gold and other treasure still hold a firm, if secondary, place in the economy of hell. But soul currency is king, and one of the more popular forms of this soul currency was primarily introduced in the fifth edition, the soul coin. The soul coin is specifically designed for the infernal economy. These coins are minted on Mineros under the watchful direction of Mammon, its archduke. The coins are made from infernal iron and are very large by coin standards, measuring five inches in diameter, which Makes sense if you think of the average size of a devil as compared to us mortal beings. Each infernally etched coin is infused with a single soul filled with despair, and the torment of the entrapped soul is palpable to anyone holding this infernal coinage. So much so that any non-evil aligned creature may only carry a few coins at a time. This restriction, of course, does not apply to evil 
aligned beings. These coins are essentially physical vessels, metaphysical prisons, if you will, of these unfortunate souls. Think of each as a simple form of the lich phylactery, only specific for these souls of the damned. And soul coins are not just morbid curiosities, but they do serve several practical uses in the infernal realms, most especially on Avernus, where they act as a standard currency. Soul coins are also sought after by some non-devils like night hags and the fiendish Raksasha. Additionally, soul coins provide a renewable energy source for the infernal war machines of the Blood War, fueled by the torment of the souls within. And by invoking a command word, one can draw upon the coin to regain health, but each use brings the soul closer to total oblivion. After three uses, the soul is annihilated, indicating that the coin's resources are inherently limited and reinforcing the thematic idea of exploitation. Indeed, the economy of the Nine Hells is fueled by mortal souls and the devils they create. And whether a larva or a lemur, neither is destined to remain in this state forever. And that is because these Nine Hells of Beator operate on a strict hierarchy, where even the lowest devils can ascend in ranks. Accomplished through acts of loyalty, discipline, treachery, prowess, and cunning, even a Lemur can catch the attention of a high-ranking devil and gain promotion to a myriad of new devilish forms. And we will break down every devil you might possibly encounter in the Nine Hells and detail the caste system and process of promotion all in Volume 6. But don't click away just yet. Before we close the pages of this volume, as always, I have some quick fiendish facts and or reviled rumors to share. And today, I have one fiendish fact and one reviled rumor. Fiendish fact number seven. You don't often realize how much of the past has been lost, forgotten, or simply left behind until you start researching for a large project kind of like we have here in these iconic lore volumes. As part of my research, I started to see and remember all these cool devil types that made their introduction into the game in previous editions, but have sadly been completely excluded or just forgotten with the latest version. And the list is pretty long. It includes a ton of different devils. The Omnizu, which is the Styx devil we touched on earlier in this volume. The horrific Caliban, which is a vestige of the Hag Countess Malagard's last reign. We have the Maragon, or Legion Devils. The Malabranch, which at the time in 3rd edition were known as War Devils, which it looks like for all intents and purposes has been merged into the Cornigons, the Horn Devils, for some reason. I do know that the term Malabranch was used in the Divine Comedy, so perhaps wizards wanted to get away from the historical reference. Not really sure why they combined the two. We also have Tiamat's own dragonkin fiends called the Abishai. They came in many different colors and generally were excluded from the normal Batazu hierarchy. We have the Falxagon or the Harvester Devils. These were your stereotypical handsome devil types, generally spending their time making packs on the material plane. The Excruciarchs, also called Pain Devils. The Brachina, or Pleasure Devils, which I guess are supposed to be succubi now, but were definitely their own thing in 3rd edition. The Dogai, Assassin Devils, they survived all the way through 4th edition. And the insect-like tormentors called the Kokrakan. And then there's the Don't Call Me a Death Knight looking Narzugon, which I guess really now are the Hell Knights in 5e, so those two have been combined as well. Some of these changes just seem a bit senseless to me, but rest assured we're going to go far deeper into some of these in Volume 6, because in my opinion, I mean, um, I have it on good authority from Gryly Tomekeeper, <laughs> most of these devils didn't just disappear, so they're still available, and they should be available to you in your current campaigns. So we're going to spend a lot of time breaking those down in Volume 6, so look forward to that. And finally, we have our first reviled rumor of this series, reviled rumor number one. There are alternative theories, or in this case, a rumor, that states contrary to what you've heard today in this volume, that when a soul arrives in Avernus, that it is immediately taken to face the infernal court. 
There, Omnizoo devil lawyers will argue about the fate of the soul based upon its deeds and sins in life. And then based on the outcome of that trial, which is, by the way, presided over by Belial, that will determine the form or rank of devil that the soul will then become. I for one think that it would be highly impractical to have such a trial for every soul that lands upon the shores of the River Styx. Although I could get behind special trials being offered to petitioners of great stature when they were alive, in their mortal life, great villains, evil kings, things like that. Or maybe even perhaps as part of the bargaining that takes place in the Fugue Plane layover. But I'll leave the ultimate determination for your table up to you. And that concludes Volume 5. Join us for Volume 6, where we'll break down that cast of devils, the process of promotion, and the disciplined hierarchy of the Bata Zoo. I hope you're enjoying our journey so far. So much more to cover. Please consider following on Twitter at Riches and Liches, checking out our Patreon, Discord, YouTube channel memberships for as little as two bucks, or a super thanks, the equivalent of buying that bar to drink at the local tavern for a tale well told. And if you feel like I earned it, sub and ring that bell to help me conquer my own big bad evil guy, the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, the only limitation at your table is your imagination.